beautiful, almost fall evening when lots of other things are going on. I'm Catherine Nichols, and I have the honor, the dubious honor, of being the president of the Board of Trustees um, of this wonderful, wonderful library that you all care enough about to be here tonight. When I was a child, and I'm sure everybody here who's over 40 remembers libraries being repositories of books, and I had a wonderful library right across the street from the home I grew up in in suburban New York. Uh, and Mrs. Gray, I'll never forget her, was really a lovely, friendly, warm presence. But she said, shh, a lot. <laughs> so I remember libraries uh, from my childhood as being full books. I guess there were magazines, but nothing else. And a lot of shh. I like to think that we are a whole lot more friendly than that that there are places where we need to be quiet, but I love the friendliness in the lobby and where people do talk to each other. And it actually, when I was thinking about this, it amazes me. Of course we have books and magazines, but we have newspapers and e-books and videos and music CDs and internet access and printers that everyone can use and MCTV and technical help. And we are far less formal about silence. We've come together to celebrate this wonderful place and consider ways to keep it wonderful, to keep it up to date, to make it safer, to keep it user friendly, and to keep it frequented. John Frieden will talk about how many people use this library. It is a very frequented library uh, compared to many of the libraries in our state. One thing I've got to say is the loss of our wonderful director, Kevin Unrath, who worked so hard all these years, three plus years with the building committee, and was a, a director extraordinaire. What a shame to lose him a month ago, but for very good personal reasons. Um, he brought his darling baby to the goodbye, um, not breakfast, but the goodbye coffee we gave for him. And it was pretty clear why she's so important to him. She's just darling. And his, he wrote his job description, kind of embroidered the one he had been given when he came. Uh, but we have added something to it because of this whole project, which he understands perfectly. But very important to, in our job description as we seek a new director is the presence of Ellsley throughout the whole Middlebury community. That's what the director will be doing. And he or she will represent this library in a variety of ways to get word out to those of, who aren't here tonight why we need a new library. I want to introduce the others who are sitting up here. John Frieden, chair of the building committee, worked really hard and also trustee. Faith Gong, trustee and frequenter with her four daughters of the children's room. Dennis O'Brien, rich and broad leadership experience at universities, member of the building committee. Tom Bachman, architect, and his fellow architects, Greg Dawson's and Diantha Corazon, a bevy of architects. <laughs> Chris Kirby, who is our adult services and technology librarian, and he and Tricia are Head of Youth Services are our acting co-directors during this time until we find our new director. Victor Nuovo, selectman and member of the building committee. Ken Perrine, who chose not to sit up here, but he's going to help us with the questions and answers. <laughs> Former president of the National Bank. Any of you who are new might not know, because he's been retired a while, but he's become the town notable. He's a broad volunteer, he has vast experience of this town and its history. Kurt Broderson, director of Middlebury Community Access TV, which is a gift that many of us don't realize how fortunate we are to have right here in our building. And Maria Graham hasn't moved yet. There are little white pieces of paper on all the chairs and pens or pencils on almost every chair if you'd like to take notes or if you'd like to write down a question for the later question and answer time. And now I turn this over right away. John Frieden. Thank you. Um, is this working? Uh, do I I'm going to give you this. Can I oh do my this? gosh, what is it? Oh, you can do it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I, was it working? Yeah, oh, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. 
Okay. I should have turned it off. I hope this isn't a dog training outfit. <laughs> um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I want to start by, I've got two things I'm going to talk about. One is, what are the critical needs that aren't currently being met in the library? And secondly, how did we get here? The first and most critical need is the children's library. It must be moved out of the basement. It's half below grade. It lacks natural light. It suffers from dampness and mold. It has no mechanical ventilating systems. It's too small and lacks appropriate spaces and adequate spaces for working separately with preschoolers, elementary school students, middle schoolers, and high schoolers. It has 15 heavy posts in steel posts that hold up the floor above it in the original building. And those posts make it almost impossible for anyone without moving all around to see what's going on in the library. And it's 17 steps from an unobserved open entrance and exit to the library. Secondly, the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. We have two heating systems. One is steam and one is hot water. Both are on their last legs. And soon will, be have, to, will soon have to be replaced. The cost of replacing the heating systems is estimated to be between six and hundred, six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars, and that doesn't change the building. That just gets heating systems that work and do their job effectively. Our cooling system consists of ten, fifteen-year-old air conditioners, which are also approaching the end of their lives and require frequent maintenance to keep them working. The rest of the building, like the children's library, has no mechanical ventilation and many of the windows don't work. If the building were renovated or we were building a new building, state law would require us to have mechanical ventilation. The community room, that's this room. Hopefully, uh, because Tom Bachman and Greg Dawson have brought their own audio-video material, you will be able to see the entire frame of what they want to show. But the ceiling is so low that frequently when we have meetings here and want to display a video or a movie, we can't get it all on the screen. This building also suffers from moisture leaks and from mold. It can't be reconfigured. It is um, used by 12,000 people a year, but we still have to turn hundreds away. And if we had flexible walls, we could probably accommodate more of those people. But there's no way to subdivide this area when it's necessary to do so. It also has an unobserved entrance. The leaks that I've referred to come from water seeping through the foundation of the original 1923 building, which is right behind the wall behind all of you. In order to fix that, it may, I don't know if there's, and maybe Tom will answer this question later, I don't know if there's a way other than to excavate the perimeter of that building and seal it from the outside. Computers. I think you're familiar with where the adult computers are. That's not an ideal position uh, for them. They can disturb people who, are work, who want quiet. And they're 
crammed in so tightly to one another that more than one person can't work on the same machine. And I'm told that's getting to be something that people like to do. And there's no place in the building for group instruction. For seniors, the front entrance, which is the only observed entrance, requires you to walk up 12 steps, which in the winter are often icy and treacherous. You have to open a heavy door. The elevator, which is on the addition that faces the new municipal <coughs> building, is also at the end of its life. And I am told that many members of the staff refuse to use it for fear that they'll get stuck between floors. So when they have to put book, take books from one level to another, They'll put the books on the elevator, and they'll walk the stairs. We need to have a new elevator. Finally, a word about safety. The front steps, obviously, are not safe, and they're certainly an unreasonable place for uh, parents with strollers uh, to bring their kids. The side entrance is unobserved and unwelcoming and close to the children, and we have to deal with the leakage in the building. So how did we get here? I assure you, when I started working uh, as a member of the building committee, I knew very little of what I just told you. And I think that is true for all of us. The building committee came about because back in uh, February of 2014, I got together with Dean George, who was then chair of the select and I did that because the library wanted to make sure that, here's another member of the building committee, Christina Johnston. The, uh, the, the library trustees wanted to make sure that the select board knew the needs of the library. And we were concerned that we had to find a better way to communicate that with them. And Dean said, well, why don't we set up a committee? consisting of two select board members, two members of the Library Board of Trustees, and then three at-large members that the original four could choose. And that's what we did. We began meeting uh, the following month, and we've met about 30 times in the last three and a half years. All of those meetings have been public, and there are minutes of them online. What did the committee do? It studied population and pupil projections and consulted with the public schools and the Ilsley staff. It studied what happens in the library. Unless you spend a lot of time here, there are so many things going on you may not know about them. As Catherine mentioned, we're not a warehouse for books any longer, though we do have lots of books. But we also lend out videos and audios. Did you know that we stream live music? And you can get almost any kind of music you want for free. Everything in the library is free. That's why it's a public library. Everything in the library is free, and you can stream from your home computer and get, on to, for your use, almost any music in the world. We teach classes after classes from things probably as simple as, uh, well maybe not simple, as, um, uh, as basket weaving or playing bridge, to how to use computers, to how to make your own videotapes. And we do that not only for adults, we do that for children. So they, uh, they get educated about media. We teach classes on computer usage. We host countless programs for children and up to the age of, through high school age, and for adults. And we're a place in, to read, to relax, to find sources of recreation, to create things, to have meetings. You know, how many of us, when we want to meet with one or two people, choose to go someplace where we have to buy something, get a cup of coffee, have lunch? You can meet here for free. We need more spaces, but it's all free here. Did you know 
that there have been no architectural changes in this entire, this is really three buildings, right? The 1977 edition with the elevator, the original building built in 1923, and this building, which includes this space and uh, two flights above it, which was built in 90, 1988, 30 years ago. There have been no architectural changes in any of these buildings in 30 years. 170,000 people come into this library every year. That makes it the first in Vermont among libraries with comparable budgets in terms of visits, circulation, program attendance, and public computer usage. We also study the future of libraries and the best practices of them. We conducted a lengthy, maybe many of you participated, a lengthy community survey. It was both available as pay on paper and on the internet to gather people's ideas about our building. 300 people completed the survey, and their greatest concerns were, dramatically, the children's area and the heating, venting, ventilating, and air conditioning, quote, system. Meanwhile, the trustees developed a new long-range plan, and the building committee used that for guidance, so we knew what we wanted to achieve in the building. And so did the architects draw on that. We hired engineers to assess the building and its systems. All of this building, all three parts of it, are, thank goodness, structurally sound. But they're structurally also inflexible. And I will get to that in a little bit more. Which makes it very difficult to change walls, to create open spaces where there are none, to move one function from one spot in the building to a place where it would work better. And in most of our systems, electricity, wiring for technology, plumbing, heating, and cooling are either outdated or sorely in need of change. We toured five recently built or renovated libraries in Essex Junction, Manchester, Montpelier, Rockingham, and Hanover, New Hampshire. We sent requests for qualifications to 15 architectural firms, some of them national and located out of state. We asked four of them to come up for interviews and chose Tom and Greg. We worked hard with Tom and Greg to see if we could fit the children into this building, the 1988 building. Let me tell you, about it. it has three floors. This is the first floor. They all have these low ceilings. Why is that a problem? Because if you want to put in new wiring, you usually have to put it in either the floor or the ceiling. We can't drop the ceilings or raise the floor because they're already too low. That's true for ducts for heating and air conditioning as well as wiring. This room, as I mentioned before, is below grade and damp, no windows, and unobserved entrance, no, it's unobserved entrance, and it's inflexible. If we could squeeze the children into here, or use some of the children in here, what, how would we replace this room for the community? I don't know. The first floor, that's the floor above this, that's where most of the adult fiction books or non-fiction books? Both. 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 And the DVDs are and the adult computers are. That's the first floor. It's the same level as a circulation desk. That, let's think about, can we move the children there? Well, it's about 800 feet smaller than where the children are already in the basement. It also is the most <clears throat> egregious example of the inflexibility of this building. It has three large steel trusses, you know, with X's, and which <clears throat> carve the space up into five, I think it's five, maybe it's six, T 
10 foot wide rows. Okay? You, is that clear? Let me, the trusses are something you probably have never noticed because they are in between stacks. Two, two shelves of stacks go up and they are held this far apart and in between them are the trusses. Okay? And going this way, you can't open up the space because you've got a truss every 10 feet. So that makes it a very hard space to reconfigure. Even if, and to replace the trusses is extremely expensive and has all kinds of unintended consequences that I doubt that we want. But if we could put the children there, or some of them, we'd have to move the books and the computers and the DVDs, and I don't know where that would be. The top floor is not broken up by trusses, so it's open. But it's also 800 feet smaller than the existing children's library. If you used both of those floors, let's say we could have the children with the trusses there. I don't know, maybe we could. We have the children there on the first floor, that's the circulation floor, and on the floor above it, all right? And we opened up the space to the floor of the reference room. That's the room with the bowed window facing Main Street. And turned that over to the children as well, also. And in addition, on the top floor, we extended that floor into the reference room to create another, uh, to make that top floor bigger, have more floor space, and to eliminate the two-story ceiling in the reference room. If we did all those things, we would still be about 1,000 to 1,200 feet short of what the children need, children being from preschool through high school. And we would have then not only to find places for the books and CDs and computers, we'd also have to find a place to replace the work areas and the comfortable chairs that people use in the reference room. Ten months ago, I'm almost done. Ten months ago, we hosted a packed public meeting here. And what we did is we broke the, everybody into small, I think six small groups. And there was a member of the staff located at each critical part of the library that these groups toured. And then they started at different ones, so everybody got to go to all six stations, if you will. And those included the children's library, the entrances, the heating plant and basement leaks, the community room, the public computer space, and adult stacks. After they did, after they did, after touring the building, each of these groups met, there were about 10 people in a group, met and talked about what they'd observed. And then they filled out forms and gave them to us. And what were the results? The children's library and the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems needed to be fixed. Finally, I just want to say a word that, of something we learned along the way. A lot of people love the garden outside here. And, the, and we on the building committee and the trustees heard that message. And I want you to know that we found a way to save it. We found out that that garden can be picked up, not just the plants, but the soil, and the critters that live and make it rich and relocate it to an appropriate place and care for it until it's time to move it back to the library in perhaps a slightly different position. And interestingly enough, it would cost less than buying new plants. So that's how we got here. And um, it's now my pleasure to introduce my friend, and our architect whom I greatly respect, Tom Bach. Thank you, John. Tom, before the
Yeah. Need to get wired up? Yeah. I might turn it off before you exchange it. It's button on the top. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one person I did want to point out, uh, John had talked about the structural system. We have Greg Sellers in the back of the room. He is a Middlebury resident, and his company is Sellers Tribal. And we did have uh, John take a thorough look at all the buildings, or all three buildings. And uh, as John had indicated, structural system in all of them is, is what, what can be seen is... <coughs> So what I want to do tonight is just briefly go through um, kind of the process that the building committee uh, went through since September of last year. That's when we were hired. As John mentioned, we had a public meeting in November. I'm going to try not to repeat much of what John said. But one point that did come up when we broke into small groups, one of the biggest uh, questions was, is this building even worth saving? There's so many issues with it. We'll get, we'll get to that, and we certainly think it is. So, I want to show you, uh, as I said, just kind of the process we've gone through. Show you the existing plans, just so you can get familiar with the way things are laid out. So, this is the existing building, just as it exists now. Uh, let's see, I've got a pointer here. The white area is the 1923 building, pretty intact. This is the 1977 edition, and anything in the green is the... Uh, am I in your way? Okay. Anything in green is the 1988 edition. So the 1923 edition is about 8,600 square feet. It's on four levels. We have people on the top floor, MCTVs on the top floor. The 1977 edition is about 2,200 square feet, and it has four floors. It provides the accessibility to the building. And then the 1988 edition, which is also three floors, is a little larger than the existing. I think it's about 8,900 square feet. Um, the existing 1924 or 1923 building is really an excellent building. It was built of great materials. It's nicely designed. It's held up very well. Uh, mechanically and electrically, it needs a lot of work. The 1977 edition, as John had mentioned, there are issues with the elevator. It is the original elevator. It doesn't meet current ADA standards. It's, it's reaching the end of its life. About 70% of the um, library patrons come through that door. And as you can see, that's a pretty darn tight entry. There's really not a lobby. And it's not a very gracious way to enter a beautiful library. Um, also, we have two, the two public bathrooms are in there. They're not supervised by the staff. They're, they're out of sight lines. There have been some issues with the bathrooms, and that in, in a library is certainly not a good situation to have bathrooms removed uh, where they can't be monitored by circulation desk. Um, also, the issue, and John had mentioned, the fact that we have kids here and people can exit there is a real security issue. I mean, typically in a library situation, you want to have the kids as far away from the entry, just for safety, so that somebody can't take a child. So that's a, that's a safety issue. The 1988 edition, which is right here, um, I, I don't really need to go through all the limitations with it. I think John did an excellent job with that. The main thing is that we're hearing from the staff, and when we see it, it's just extremely inflexible. Um, the trusses on the second floor, as John mentioned, I, I've just never seen a building quite like this, and there's just no way that you could feasibly reconfigure that room. Top floor is a little better, but all of the uh, 1988 edition suffers from really low, uh, really low ceilings. Uh, this, you know, this is a very large room to have an eight-foot ceiling, and it's a very large room to have this many people with no ventilation system that works. So that's part of the problem. Uh, John mentioned the mechanical systems are. Antiquated, we had a mechanical engineer from uh, Rutland Engineering Services did an analysis of all the mechanical systems and all the electrical systems. Uh, the mechanical systems, they said basically there's not much that they can save. I mean, we're, it's reached the end of its life. When the 1988 edition was built, there was a ventilation system up in the attic, but for some unknown reason it was removed. So we have no ventilation in the building at all. 
which is a, a, a pretty large code issue. And I think if you just, I mean, it's a little stuffy in here tonight. Wait until 9 o'clock. Yeah. I'm sorry? Wait until 9 o'clock. Yeah. And I can imagine if we had this room full, it would be uh, even worse. So this is, the, uh, this is the lower level. Another issue with the 1988 edition, I think, is the fact that the floors, it, it's, what they tried to do, I think, is line up floors as best they can. That's one of the reasons we end up with such low floor-to-floor -floor heights in this building. Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. This is the um, second level. No, I'm sorry. Third level. Here we go. This is the second level. These. Okay. These are the trusses that what John was mentioning. There's just not much we can do with that. Um, yeah, they look pretty innocuous in that drawing because you just seen the vertical elements. But you remember those are big X's going through. So. They have more impact than those dainty little <laughs> squares <laughs> on the plan. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the layout for the shelving is is logical, but that's about all you could ever do with that room. If you took those shelves out of there, it would be a very, very difficult room to use. This is the third floor. Again, uh, you can see the, uh, the existing, the 1977 and the uh, 1988 edition. Fictions on the third floor. Um, and then MCTV is on the top level, and there is no top level in the uh, 1988 edition. Now this is uh, this is a very interesting slide. This is the existing site plan. So what you can see, this red line is approximately the property lines. I mean, this has not been surveyed. This is what we've gotten from the town. This is the uh, municipal building. So you can see. There is about 2,000 square feet right there next to the uh, existing, I think it's a cinema, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've got a little bit of lawn in front, and then we've got our garden space there. So you can see we are really a landlocked building. This is uh, probably one of the tightest sites that we've looked at for libraries, and there's just not a logical place to do an addition on this, although we came up with uh, several different options, and we'll show you those in a minute. As far as programming, uh, we've worked with the staff, we've worked with the building committee. Um, the needs are about 6,500 square feet is what they're saying, or what, what we think you need to add to the library to function the way uh, the library should function. And that space obviously, obviously should be as flexible as it possibly can be. So 6,500 square feet is a little bit less then just to put it in perspective, a little bit less than the 1923 original building. That's about 8,600. So that's how much space we need to meet your programs to bring in additional computers, to expand the children's library by about 2,000 square feet, to give the janitorial and maintenance and mechanical space adequate space, to provide more um, meeting space. So those, that, that, that's what that's adding up to. And this, I don't expect you to read this, but it is just a graphic representation. So anything in white, for instance, current level zero, that's how much space you have. And what the pink is representing is showing how much bigger this level should be to meet the needs that you have. Same thing with current first level. There's that. And then we're saying that the amount in pink is shown, shows how much space you need to meet your program. Same thing with second level and third level. So what we've done then is every space down below the children's library, these are the spaces we need to meet the current program. So this is just a graphic representation so you can compare uh, what you have and what you need. Sure. You can see that well over half of the existing spaces require some degree of expansion to meet future needs. And then there are a few, like the little pink squares, there are a few spaces that are just brand new. To be, to be a library of the future. Okay. And, that's what, and you know, we were talking about flexibility. I mean, that's one thing. No one knows what the library in 20 years is going to be. We don't know how, how services are going to be uh, delivered. We don't know if it's going to be full of books or if it's a whole different system. So that's where the flexibility is so important. And we're, we're we've, uh, working with a couple other libraries right now, and we're hearing the exact same thing that we're hearing here. The buildings aren't flexible. The way we are delivering services and the way we're, we're delivering books and 
computers is so different than it used to be, so we need to have a building that can change with the time. So that's what we're striving to do. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, you, you saw the previous site, uh, the, the, the site plan, where it was unbelievably tight. So we were tasked by the building committee, what can we do with this site? And we came up with three different options. There were some pluses and minuses with each option, and then we took those pluses, pluses and put them in a new scheme. So this scheme, this is just more for information. This is not the direction we were going. But we were trying to figure out how could we maintain parking, how could we work with the buildings that are here, and how do we provide the space you need. So the solution, this solution was, oh, sorry. Nope, oh, wrong way. This solution, we call it a bar scheme, was to put a two-story building up over the existing parking. So the uh, parking would remain just as it is because we know parking is an issue. We would elevate this on piers. There was a lot of concern with this. Um, part of it was the connections to the existing building. And I think the building committee also felt like it's yet another addition to a building that's had several additions, and it's really not solving the problem. And also you can see it's just basically so circuitous. It's mm -hmm. a, kind of a security interactive nightmare. It would be a very hard uh, building, we think, for staff to monitor. And this had things like, you know, what do we do with these uh, funny little spaces in here? We were looking at internal gardens, but this was just not a direction that we ended up going. The next scheme was a very interesting concept, but we threw it out pretty quickly. It was, what can we do if we surround this building, fill in that 20, 2,500 square feet, whatever that is, green area, and does it make sense to look at acquiring adjacent buildings and expanding the library in there? And this was dismissed pretty early because of, again, connections. It, it's, it's another addition. The floors with the... Uh, uh, theater didn't line up, we would just end up with all kinds of elevations to deal with. And also there was a lot of concern, I think rightfully so, that we'd be taking a, a building off the tax roll. And that gets another point. The next scheme is, this is where we started getting a little bold. What happens if we take off the 1988 edition which is functioning? So this was called an interior courtyard scheme where we were doing that, removing the building, doing some sort of an internal area there, maintaining all the parking, and creating a big plaza there. Um, one thing it did very nicely, which uh, the building committee caught their eye immediately, was it starts reintroducing the lawn out front, which starts bringing a little more prominence to the building. And the final scheme we looked at was what happens if we really think big? What happens if somehow we can build on the entire property line that we've got and put parking underneath. Um, this was, I think, a pretty darn ambitious scheme and it had too much reliance on what's going to happen with this development piece over here. Uh, and then I think there was also a lot of concern, and I think this is an excellent concern, that because we are basically building the library there, connecting it with this link, is the existing library, the 1923 building, is it going to become a museum? Is it not going to contribute and work as part of the library? And I think that's a really valid concern. This scheme also took off the addition. So from these schemes, what, what do we do? We came back to the committee then with a solution that took what we thought and the committee thought the best aspects of each property, uh, each uh, solution. So I'm going to take you right into that. So here is, here's, here's the solution we're looking at tonight. Here is the 1923 building. Here's the municipal building. We would be taking off the 1977 edition, and we would be taking off the 1988 edition. And that, I can remember when we presented that to the building committee, we were a bit gun-shy. I mean, it's a very ambitious project, but the more we looked at it, the more we think that it does solve the problems for the next 50 years or 100 years. We don't know how long. But it's, it, it is a bold move, but it gives the library the flexibility that they really need, 
and it also connects to the existing library very well. So I think one of the biggest strengths of this is that the existing library maintains a very important part. It's, it's just part of the library. It's all one unit. So this does maintain all the parking. And I think one of the beauties of the scheme is we are entering from the parking lot side at grade, and we're also able to enter from Main Street at grade. That's one of the uh, one of the big issues that uh, the committee and the staff really felt was important that we have at grade access from Main Street. So the historic building, the stairs remain just as they are, but we would have a slight ramp here that takes you up to grade. Um, I don't remember exactly what the grade is, but it's the same grade as is out back now. So you enter the building here, you enter the building here, and that whole first floor level is at grade. Um, we see this as you know, some of the site amenities is we've got this great plaza out back, which would be a wonderful place for people to congregate. It's south facing in the sun. It'd be a great place for children to have programs. We did a, um, a library in, middle, in uh, Montpelier several years back it's got a big public plaza out front, and that is used in good weather all the time by students. It's used by the public. You walk by their lunch, there are people sitting out there having lunch, and that's what we're trying to create here. And then we see in the front, this would be a little more quiet. I mean, we could see cafe tables in the lawn here, where people that wanted to just sit outside and read, and maybe not participate in a more active area, it could be out in front of the building. So that's, that's the site plan, and you can see we're pretty much filling up what there is on the site. When we did meet with the uh, development or design review board for the city or the town, uh, we did present the project, and it was very interesting. They, first of all, they were, um, I, I think they were impressed with the project, but they wanted to make sure, uh, one thing they suggested is that we build as much space as we can on this site so that we don't, aren't doing this again, and they also saw as a possibility with a lower level basement as solving some of the town's needs also for some storage space. So I'm going to show you the floor plans. Uh, question? Yeah. What's going to happen to the existing entrance? I'm sorry? What's going to happen to the main existing main entrance? It will remain. It still, it can be, uh, it could either be operable or it could be locked if we wanted to direct people in. I think it would probably be a non-functioning entrance because we really want to funnel people into the circulation desk. Think of the uh, Fletcher Allen in Burlington. Familiar with that at all? Where they did an addition onto it, and then there was the grand entry, and now the grand entry isn't really a usable entry, but it's like sitting steps, and people are hanging out on it all the time, which is kind of neat. But then the other entry is shifted over to the what would be to the uh, east side of the library. So we've spent a lot of time with the building committee and the, uh, the staff kind of laying this out. But remember, this is a study, so there's so much more work that has to happen. I would never say, this is the floor plan, or this is, this is what the building is going to look like exactly. We're showing you a solution that would be developed if, uh, if things proceed. So this is the lower level, and just so you understand this, this is... Um, this is basically it's storage mechanical equipment, but it's the size of the entire building. It's six feet lower than we are right now. So it really is subterranean space. So we're seeing if we can put storage, mechanical, all the equipment down there, it's allowing us to, oh, sorry, keep going the wrong way. It, it's allowing us to use the existing building a lot more efficiently. We don't have to have mechanical space. We don't have to have uh, as many janitorial closets and stuff in there. So we're looking at this as, as a true basement. It would not have windows. It's, it's basically storage space and, and that sort of thing. We would be providing an outside uh, entrance in the back to be getting equipment up and down there. So what this is, is this is six feet lower than we are now. So what we would be doing with this plan is in 1988, the kind of grand stair in the original building, 1923 building, was taken out. We would be reintroducing that as the one of the main circulation paths through there. I think one of the biggest criticisms we have of this building is there's no there's no kind of grand stairway. 
you circulate through two fire stairs, and they're very narrow and very uninviting. So what we're trying to do is make circulation a lot more eventful and comfortable. So we would be reinstituting those uh, stairs. Uh, we think that the MCTV people in the lower level, the existing building, makes a lot of sense. They don't need a tremendous amount of uh, windows. John had alluded to the fact that there are moisture and, and uh, water problems with the existing basement. There certainly are. So <clears throat> part of the project that we've budgeted would be to dig around that entire foundation of the original building. We would be putting, waterproofing the foundation, insulating it, doing drains. So that, that basement, all of this, is as comfortable as upstairs. It may not have the windows, but it becomes really viable, usable space and it seems like a perfect place for MCTV. They would like to be a little more visible than not being tucked up in the attic. So we're, we're looking at this as, you know, there be some sort of a glass connector so you can see into the studio. And they become more a part of the library. And I think that really works well. But there's we, nobody down there. I mean, it's the basement, right? I'm sorry? If you're sticking MCTV in the basement, they'll be lower than here. No, no. 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 They're in the original building. They're in the basement where the children's library is right now. Okay, yes. Okay, so you're going to have one basement that's six feet lower? Yes. It, so it's only six feet of steps? No, 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 no. Traverse. No, because then the floor, you've got about 12 foot of depth there. No, that's not a six foot ceiling. And see, we've got an no, elevator. No, no. I meant you're only going up six foot yes. to get to the... To, to, yeah, so it's, to it's a split level now. scheme. Okay. Yeah. We have an elevator. The elevator is relocated into the new addition and it serves the existing building. So the elevator is strategically placed so that it serves all of the addition. And it also goes down to the basement, uh, talking to staff, you know, if we're going to really use this as viable storage space, it needs an elevator access. And I think that's, that's, that's hard to argue. So then on the main level... Wait, can I ask one question about MCTV? Do, you were saying this is hard to run wiring and stuff. I mean, MCTV needs a lot of wiring. Mm -hmm. This will be gone. Oh, you're destroying this? Mm -hmm. This is gone. This, this, tape, this is removed. Oh, I thought you were just digging around the... No, no. Okay, so this is all the, being replaced. The foundation we're digging around is the original building. The solution that we're looking at now is taking down the 1988 edition, mm -hmm. putting in a much larger edition, and taking down the 1977 edition. We're in the 1988 edition right now. Oh, I thought we were in the 1923 one. No, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah exactly. If you look at this, that's the outline of the 1988 edition. We are, let's think about this. We're right, 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 right there. there. Yeah. There's the entrance that you all walked in, or most of you walked in. Children's Library is over there now. Okay. Now this is the main level. As I mentioned, we have wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with elevation changes because the floor-to-floor -floor height in the 1923 buildings, are, it's pretty tight. So I think we've worked up a solution that uh, we're pretty happy with. So as I mentioned, Here's a plaza, the parking lot's not changing. Here is the entrance to the front off of Main Street, coming a vestibule, coming a vestibule. You're in kind of a grand lobby. Circulation is here. This is a, I think this is a, um, a very important point. We have circulation in the center, so they can see any public coming in this way. They can see any public coming in that way. We've scattered reading rooms around here. Remember, we have reintroduced this stair. So you then are going up back into the historic part of the building. The historic part of the building, we would be, right now, staff is all back in there. That would all be removed. The historic part of the building is used for stacks and adult and, and reading rooms. So the building is being restored under this scenario. Again, stair. There's our elevator. So the elevator, you enter here, and then you enter through here to get into the existing building. We've got all the staff located in this area, which is uh, nice instead of having them scattered over the, uh, all over the building. We have two public bathrooms here that are adjacent to circulation, so they can be monitored. They're not tucked away where nobody knows what's going on. And the way this meeting room, this has a 12-foot ceiling, which if you can imagine a room that's bigger than this, that's four feet taller. It's going to make a, it would make a huge difference. 
The room will be configured so you can close it off, divide it into separate meeting rooms. And then we've maintained a nighttime entrance so it functions just like this building does. Uh, you can come in at night, come through the vestibule, use the room, have access to the bathrooms, and there will be a secure door right there. In the daytime, I would assume this door would be locked so we know who's coming into the building. And anybody using this room would check in with circulation, come through there. We're also scattering uh, meeting rooms throughout the building. And so you've heard that from uh, everybody, that we need more meeting space. And then this is kind of the grand stair that takes you upstairs. This is a very wide and gracious stair. And the idea is this is a stair that does more than just kind of get you up there. It's going to have landings, seats you can sit, you can talk. So it's, uh, it's, it's really something the building is currently lacking. And then when you come in this uh, entry, we've opened up the floor here. We want to make sure that if somebody comes in, whether you enter from Main Street or the back, you know that there's a lot more to this library. So it's a hole in the floor. You can look up and see the children's library. You can look up and see the adult section on the top floor. That's one thing we've really tried to do is make sure that the building is um, readable. When you get into it, you know there's more. What we've looked at, just trying to keep this as flexible as we can, we're trying to structure, we, we would structure this so we'd have four columns in this big square. Anything can move, anything can move other than those columns. So I think you're ending, and the, and the elevator. So I think you're ending up with a, a space that can completely morph into whatever the needs are. So you know, the goal with the, uh, the original building, the really cool original building, is to help it, uh, restore it back to its grandeur. To, to make it function the way it was originally intended to function. Now it's been kind of chopped and cobbled and things moved around, rightly so, but it's lost the charm and the grandeur of its former self. That's one thing. And another one is this dual entry area. Um, we've often heard the libraries we work on, we, we, libraries often are like the community living room. Well, that's kind of what that space is going to be. It's going to be a space that all ages can use, and it'll be a really welcoming, true community Joint, you know, like a and, and you know, one thing we've heard is um, uh, we, we need many different varied spaces. So we've got some, if, if you're more social, you would probably be in this area. If you want to kind of squirrel yourself away, you might be sitting in here or on the stair or somewhere. So we're trying to give lots of different uh, spaces that people can uh, choose whatever they feel most comfortable with. Second floor, this is the second floor, uh, we're looking at children's library on the second floor, and this floor matches the existing second floor perfectly, so it's, there's no ramps or anything. We still have an elevator, obviously, we have an elevator on every floor, but you can pass through here. This would be the teen, the middle school area. I mean, that age group likes to have <coughs> somewhat of their own space. So what we've tried to do is give them a space that can still be monitored. Uh, in speaking with the librarians, that space is often used after hours and on weekends. So we would also see this being set up as a meeting space. So if the kids aren't in there during the day, somebody can go in there and work. So we're trying to make the spaces as flexible as we possibly can. And remember, just so you can get orient yourself, this area is a two-story space. You look over down into that part of the uh, library, we would be providing some sort of an acoustic glass wall mm -hmm. so that noise didn't travel down there. I think that's a big complaint we hear right now. So we've got um, staff in circulation here. We're providing a bathroom for the little kids. We've got story room. So we've tried to zone it into different age groups. And again, there's so much more work that needs to be done, working with staff in great detail on all of this, exactly where the shelves are, where the seating is. So We've, we've barely scratched the surface with a solution here. We just determined how much space we need where we think it makes sense. So I think there's, uh, you know, we've, had, uh, we've met dozens of times and there's hundreds of meetings I think that will happen if this project moves ahead. Question. On the middle school area, what's the office? Is that for a staff member to be in there? Yes. I mean, because otherwise there's no monitor. That's exactly. We, we're thinking okay. we would put a staff member there, and that could also be used as meeting space. I mean, basically, some of these spaces are labeled, but 
Okay. Well, I was just wondering because you, you kept talking about sight lines for yeah. staff right. and circulation yeah. desk, and there's nothing. Well, here. this is open, and that's going to be open through there too. So, and we might, you know, depending. There's a, there's always this fine line with historic preservation. We would love to open that stair up more, but we may have issues with the state division of historic preservation. We have met with them. We've talked about the concept, and they are delighted that the direction we're heading is restoration of the existing building. Mm -hmm. I just have a question about the children's room because I know Vermont is a decreasing state. Mm -hmm. We're kind of running out of children. Um, do, I'm just the devil's advocate. Do we really need that much space? If, if the, I mean, the elementary school has less and less kids in it. Mm -hmm. I think I, I trust you. Maybe you should address this. Well, you're doing your bit. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, currently the kindergarten and first grades are actually the largest classes at Mary Hogan right now. Um, so for this very moment, we're not seeing decreasing populations. We're seeing. Yeah, we're, we're not talking in 20 but, years. Yes, talking in 20 years, and we don't know. Those babies aren't born yet. Um, but I can tell you that the space we currently have does not meet where, where we, the population we currently I know, serve. I know that we need more space, but it's, right. it's a happy medium. You know, we don't need the Rolls Royce when we don't have the taxpayer basis for a Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. We want something like middle, middle of the road. So. Actually, I, I do want to address that. I, we've been working staff. And I've been very impressed. I mean, our first program was considerably larger than this. Mm -hmm. And they they took every space and reduced, reduced, reduced. So I really believe what the staff has asked for, what we're seeing in other libraries, you're you're very conservative here. Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think we're building I think I think the fact that we're proposing taking off two editions is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the spaces that are being asked for are anything out of the ordinary. In fact I think the Staff has done a wonderful job of... Um, What's the square footage for the uh, kids in the middle school? Uh, right now, you have... A, 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 no, on this. On this. In this? Um, well, I have to check tight, because I have a cheat sheet back here. Um, okay, children's currently... This is what the... Currently has about 2,700 square feet scattered throughout the lower level, and there's a 2,000 square foot increase. So that floor is about 4,700 square feet. And this isn't for you, but for the librarians. Is, do we know the percentage of like services and circulation stuff that the by, youth does? By age group? Yeah. Not off the top versus of my head. Adult versus kids, middle school, high school. The circulation of materials is almost even for number okay. of items checked out. Okay. And I, I might suggest that we get through this and then we... Uh, uh, come with questions. We can come back to any slide that you want to. Okay, and this is the top level of the edition. Again, I mentioned there's openings in the floor. This is adult fiction and poetry. We've got a bathroom located in this area, elevator. And then what we are looking at doing right now is the uh, current MCTV space. It's actually a very nice space. It's, it's an attic. But it's, it could be nice, I think, with some, uh, some work. We're looking at making that a meeting room and also a permanent home for the friends that would have uh, shelving around there so it would be uh, the bookstore doesn't need, or the uh, book sale doesn't need to be constantly set up. So we're trying to give a permanent home to that. Now, what's this going to look like? You don't know. <laughs> oh. This is the back entrance. So. Here's your existing library. <coughs> We're trying to maintain the uh, integrity of it. And all of this is this addition we've been talking about. Tom, it's hard to see the red. It, it Maybe you need to go slower. Does that help? OK. Yeah. OK. Can people see that? Yes. Yeah. OK. Existing library. This is the proposed addition. Again, I can't emphasize enough, we have not this, this is basically a concept. There is so much development that needs to happen on this, but we wanted to look at what a building of this size would look like. We don't know what the materials are. What we do know, I mean, some givens are <coughs> this area is the big lobby. 
This is kind of the front door. This is really the uh, oomph in the, in the design. So we see this as being a pretty glassy corner. It's south facing. It gives a wonderful opportunity to see into the building from the bridge and to know that something's going on there. So I think you can see through the building there is, as I mentioned, some openings in the floor. So you can look up through and see that there's something happening everywhere. We're uh, providing covered entrance here. There'd be a book drop area right by there. So we're seeing this as a pretty darn important corner of the building. Now here's a slide I really like. This shows what the library would look like if we took off that 1988 edition. This area right in there is your current reference room. And if you go through there, you can see the remnants of where those windows were. Those would be reinstalled. So this building is going to have the prominence that it had when it was built in 1923. We see, again, a real opportunity to do something glassy. We don't know if this is the form, but something glassy on Main Street that, again, allows you to really see into the library and let people in the library really see out and see this whole kind of grand new entrance. So when, when, uh, when we started talking about possibly taking the addition off, we saw it as a wonderful opportunity to fully restore the existing library and put it back to the importance that it had on Main Street when it was originally built. Now, what's this going to cost? <laughs> so basically, we have gone through, we've, we've had a professional cost estimator look at this with us, and I'm not going to go down line, line by line, but basically the preliminary total construction cost for everything you see is $8.7 million. That's taking off both additions and building the uh, roughly 19,000 square feet that we're talking about. And then, with also any, be noted in that 8.7 million, 1.3 million is a contingency. Yeah. Because we are at such a conceptual level of design, we, to be safe, you always have to put a, some sort of a contingency sign in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yeah, that's built in. And actually, that's a very good point. Usually, as design develops, if this moves ahead, that contingency number reduces, reduces, reduces. To a project like this, we would probably get that down instead of 15% closer to five or seven and a half percent, once more things are known. We don't know, uh, we don't know issues with uh, if there are hazardous materials in this building yet, that sort of thing. So there's a lot, a lot of studies that have to, have to happen. So when you add in, there's also soft cost, that's all the permitting, it's insurance that you need to carry, design fees, clerk of the works if you decide that uh, that's an important thing to do. Um, that takes the project cost up to about 9.6 million. So the project that we're looking at right now is in that range. And these you know, cost estimates, again, would get more and more refined as we know more and more about the building. Can I ask a question about this slide? Sure. Um, from the very bottom, uh, can you, I know these are excluded, but if you just give us a rough rule of, you know, ballpark estimate, what would uh, the solar panels and lead certification cost? Roughly? Well, actually, it's interesting should ask. We did a, a headquarters for a bank in uh, Montpelier. They put enough solar panels on to basically run their facility, and the cost was about $80,000. Lead services, you're, you're, you're going to spend a little more on lead, maybe 5%, but it is a huge, it's, it's huge, because you get a building that is just so much tighter and your operating costs are less. When you say 5%, you mean 5% of the 8.7? Yeah, and that, that, that's, a, that's a real rough number. Well, that's, that's, and that's also like to take the lead platinum or something. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. this building cost is a very, it factors in a very energy efficient building. Yeah. Beyond code. So lead is more of the rigor of the process. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's administrative costs. But if you just wanted to kind of go all out, I mean, the town's 5% would, would cover it. But, but you're starting from a pretty doggone high level to begin with. Far beyond, far better than code. That's so you're saying it would be somewhere between 120 and 150 thousand more. It would just it round number. Yeah, it's just it's hard to know until we have a design, but right. yeah, something like that. But as Greg said, I mean, all the buildings we do 
far exceed the energy code. So you're going to end up with an unbelievably tight, airtight <coughs> building to begin with. I mean, we, we've got uh, you know, a, a decent budget here, not extravagant, but it's going to give you really high R, value when, uh, R values for your walls, ceilings, probably triple glazing. So that's kind of uh, how we approach buildings. I'm just curious, uh, during, the, during the construction process, what would happen to the current library contents and what would happen to the services, and is that taken into account? Well, that's a very good question, and I don't think there's a plan in place yet. We've certainly talked about it. If, if this were to happen, we think the children's library could function exactly where it is as it's functioning now during the construction. MCTV could stay upstairs, but you've got this whole building to empty out, and other libraries have taken, I mean, nobody knows exactly what the best solution is. Maybe things go into storage and staff goes retrieves books. I mean, there, there are a lot of different scenarios, but that's, that's a big one. I mean, John had talked about possibly moving some stuff to the... Um, Sarah Parkman's library. Yeah. They have a bottom floor, yeah. which is open. Uh, could put a bunch of books there. Maybe there are other places in town that are, you can do that as well. We may have to rent some space. Yeah. That's definitely an issue, but it's... <clears throat> How big. long would that rental, that move be? A project like this would probably take 12 to 14 months. Mm -hmm. I think we need to keep moving time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and basically, <clears throat> I'm going to put something that looks better than the cost estimate. Something you can look at. <laughs> and uh, open it up for questions. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. So my role is to moderate the question and answer period. And so to help me with that, I would ask you if you have a question to raise your hand, I will recognize you and then you can pose your question or comment uh, and the appropriate person from this group hopefully will answer that. Uh, I would say that we would like all questions, any comments, questions, concerns, whatever you want. This is an opportunity for the trustees to hear and get feedback on this project, this particular proposal, um, or they're just the needs of the library in general. <clears throat> if you are uncomfortable raising your hand and speaking in public, there are pieces of paper on the chairs with pencils or pens, and you may write your question on that, pass it forward. And Chris, can I ask you to just kind of, if there are ones that come, bring them up to me, and then periodically during the q and I'll pick one up and read it, um, uh, and hopefully get your question or comment posed. <laughs> so, <clears throat> questions. David. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. David Andrews. I used to be the uh, chair of the library trustees, and uh, I think the plans are absolutely fantastic. I, I just visually love it. I love the way it embraces the original structure. It's an expensive project, and uh, I know you're talking about the idea of some private fundraising alongside presumably some public funding as well. And I think it's important that if you're anticipating private fundraising to do a feasibility study and really nail that down because that was not one of the stronger aspects of the 1988 project. Um, the goals for fundraising for that project were greatly undershot. So I think it's really important to remember that and to do a better job this time. Good point. We've raised, uh, we've uh, contracted with Christine Graham, uh, a Burlington firm who's used, who has done feasibility studies for many Vermont libraries as well as other institutions. And she will do this when we think we're ready, depending our, on our director and on getting the word out, but in the near future. Mm -hmm. So thank you for raising that. 
Okay, we have a question in the back. Young lady there. Um, I'm Bobby Loney, and I'm wondering if you could put up the first floor. Try raising a little higher. The old building, first floor, which is to me, as you had mentioned, it's like classic and beautiful, those great big windows. And I was, I don't understand having stacks in that area, although I don't know where else you'd put them with everything else. It just seems like a shame to fill that space with stacks. Uh, yeah, John's going to try to answer. I, I don't need to. Um, <laughs> you get it on the video. I think you're absolutely right, Bobby. I don't think we would put stacks there, frankly. I think that's most likely to be a, a reading room with stacks along the walls, as we have now. But your point, your point is a good one, and uh, we really want to make that a glorious space, and we don't want it obstructed by stacks. We just have to, you know, really, what this is is an exercise at finding out how we can create the amount of floor space we need. Right, as Tom has pointed out, anything can be moved within the building. Because once we know. Because the building is open, it doesn't have interior posts or, or trusses. And once we know where we want them, then they will, we'll move them around accordingly. Sure. I think it's also good to know that one of the purposes for more space um, was a reduction in the height of stacks. So when we're talking about stacks in this new plan, we're not talking about the stacks that you see in our current building that even if we do have stacks in the historic building, they are likely to be waist high. So still having, sorry, still having an open field. They won't be the over your head, cut up the room sort of stacks. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the shelving we envision for the library would be no higher than five and a half feet high. And it would be, it would be that would be the highest. We'd have a, a mix of of uh, shelving, five and a half feet high in some places, four feet high in others, but it would it would allow us to display. It would be display shelving that would allow us to feature titles, and it would and it would, as Trisha was saying, open up the view. Next question, Laura. Thank you. Um, John, you did an excellent job of summarizing the whole process. Really a beautiful job. And the architects did a great job of the overview, which I also support. Um, so I'm hoping for as close to a net zero building as we could get. I'm interested in how you're thinking of heating the building. Mm -hmm. I do want to assure, be assured that it's a solar ready roof. Mm -hmm. um, I am curious about whether they're, the, the thermal loss with the glass is significant or not. I understand its advantages, but I know that it has a thermal cost, so I'm just inquiring about that. And I'm also interested in whether there's been a conversation program-wise about the capacity for a visitor center, like do you envision that and where would it go, you know, as part of it, like because it seems like it might have that capacity, like a lot of people will come in and, and and seek information about the town. So I'm just curious about that. And and I'm also interested in the conversation about phasing the work and financing and what you have discussed with regard to that. So there are a few <laughs> questions in that. And, and, and let me let let's break it up, Laura, if we okay. can. So you let's, can help us with that. So first of all, you had questions about the net zero. Right. And, did, and was this, that was that just a comment, or did you want a quite an answer to that? Just a comment. You know, what is your plan for heating the space? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we don't know yet. Uh, the 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 number that John had given you of I don't know six to seven hundred thousand dollars of mechanical needs for this building was a, that assumed that nothing was happening. That's what you need to do this building. They were looking at 
converting your steam system to water and still using fuel. I don't think we would be proposing that with the addition, but we haven't done enough study yet to know whether it would be air source heat pumps, whether it makes sense to look at the gas line coming through town. There would be energy modeling done on the building that's going to tell us exactly, you, you mentioned glass, how much glass does make sense there. We don't know if it's 100% glass. Uh, so that, that, that again, those, those are excellent questions, but I think we don't have answers for this right now. So, Laura, you had, a, you had another question at the end. Can you repeat that, please? Visitor center. Well, I had two. I yeah, had visitor, center. <laughs> visitor center. The visitor center, so that you could. Okay. Talk Anybody to that. want to? Sounds like a good that. idea, uh, but again, it's one of these flexible issues. Uh, it, one of the things that struck me about the uh, uh, vista from the street is that somebody would look at that and say, "This is a very attractive building. I want to go in there." And it might be an ideal place to have some sort of visitor center. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the question that you can, all of this space is flexible. And who knows, by the time we get around to financing it, there may be a very different way in which you want to look at some of it. The, I believe the place in Manchester, the new uh, library down there, they have provided for weddings. <laughs> and I know that the one in uh, the one in Mount Peter has a big ball every year, uh, right? Yeah. So Laura, so your third question. Phasing the financing. Phasing the phasing in the financing. Well, I can't speak to financing, but I can speak to phasing. This solution is not. This solution is not easily phased. It's it's one one big mass. I think the only thing that might make sense if phasing was an option is you take that top floor, build it now, but it's not finished. That's the only way I see making any attempt at phasing because we need to make it fully accessible. It's not the kind of solution where you would add 25% in 10 years. I think you really need to build the footprint now, build it, but maybe just not finish it all. That's, that's the best answer I've got on phasing because I don't think there's a uh, there's not a clear cut way to do that. Would one of the trustees like to tackle the financing question? Oh, Laura. Well, I'll I'll, I'll handle it. Why not? Uh, um, uh, I would hope. Um, that we would be able to raise 50, 50 to 60 percent of the cost of this project with private funds. Those would be from any source other than the town. But the library is actually a department of the town. And therefore, there's going to have to be a bond. And a decision, which is not going to be an easy one for the uh, select board, and for the people who pay taxes. Um, just to give you some sense, um, every million dollars of borrowing requires about a penny on the tax rate. So if we had to borrow $5 million for this project, that would mean your taxes would increase by five cents. Um, which so would be uh, five cents on your tax rate. So on a two hundred thousand dollar home, that would be one hundred dollars. Would be one hundred dollars on a two hundred thousand dollar home. At current rates. Yeah, that's it. I mean, this is what Jack Casella, the town treasurer, has told me. Okay, we have a question over here. Right behind you, Chris. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, my apologies for coming in late. Uh, this is a crazy day for me. Uh, and my congratulations to the uh, architect for the fine presentation. I have one quick comment and two perhaps irrelevant questions. Um, the comment is some of my clients, which are uh, universities, have had similar reconstruction of their library and movements. And what's interesting is they notice that during that phase of, of moving books around and hiding them and making them available, they notice an uptick in use of electronic resources. So it could be this is an opportunity over that 12 to 14 months to get people in the area to use more e-books and e-reserves and so on. Uh, first question, did you address the stylistic aesthetic clash between ancient marble and you know, Georgian structure and 21st century glass? Did you talk about that already? 
I mean, yeah, basically, our approach with any new building is that it ought to look like it's built today. Right. So we would never, we would never come to you with a solution that tried to make this look like the 1923 building. It just wouldn't work, especially with scale. And part of the problem we see with the 1988 edition, if you've ever been up on this roof, I have never seen such a convoluted roof plan <laughs> trying to make everything mesh to have those pitches on there. So to us, it just seems to make a lot more sense to keep this simple and really put the existing building in the front. This is, this is the important building. So we're looking at our building as almost a background building to the existing building. We want the existing building to be the one you know as a foreground. Yeah. So I mean, but to another answer is we, we really haven't studied it much. What you saw is a massing diagram with intentions of where we think the building ought to be transparent and where we think the building ought to be opaque. That's it. It's nice to hear someone say transparent, mean that literally. Yes. <laughs> the, the last question again, this, I may have missed this if you mentioned it before, this may refer to interior redesign issues which could be superfluous at this point. What about designing for modern media? That is, uh, have you considered, for example, the number of Wi-Fi points that you need to have? Do you have, uh, have you built in lots lots of power outlets and that kind of I mean, that's hard to future proof. Yeah, not at this point, but every library we've done has that. So I don't think that's ever, it, it, it's not an issue at all. We would be working with a, an electrical engineer, of course. Uh, we'd be working with whoever the staff, people know most about this MCTV. So I don't think that's, uh, we just haven't looked at any of those issues yet. And that also includes the exterior of the building. Charge ports and stuff outside. I mean, yes. we're, we're, we're creating some significant, both quiet and active outdoor spaces and we want to make sure people can use their electronic media in those spaces. So. Actually, it's, it's interesting. Even, even things as simple as electric car charging, we're starting to see more and more, I mean, we put them in almost all of our buildings, but when you hear that Volvo in 2019 will only have electric cars, you know everybody's going to be following that. So I think it makes a lot of sense to put in the infrastructure. Maybe you don't have the uh, charging stations now, but every one of those parking spaces out back should be able to accommodate that in five years or ten years, whenever that happens. Thank you. Bob. Uh, this is in response to John Frieden. Uh, I was chair of the uh, building board in 1988, and I led the fundraising <laughs> the 1988 edition, and I was dismayed at the difficulty we had getting uh, funding from people in the community. And <clears throat> we ended up far under what we uh, targeted. And when that happens, where does the additional money come from? What did you do? I think I've repressed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I speak to that very briefly? My experience building a lot of buildings for colleges and universities, one of the worst things you can do is you shut, you come short of funds and then you begin to cut the project and you end up with a lousy project. Yeah. Uh, I said at one point when we were looking at this, well, we can't afford any of those schemes, we might just as well do the right one. And this is the right one. And if you look at the alternatives that we went through, including building a brand new library, we had one uh, gentleman who had been on the board in the past who came to us repeatedly to with sites, other sites within town where we could build a brand new library. And he thought it was the right thing to do, to start right from the ground up. The difficulty is that's even more expensive than this project. So uh, I, I think that it's, it's, you could build some of these other projects that we looked at, the bar scheme and so forth, you'd end up with a half-baked project, and in about 10 years, somebody would say, why did we do that? Why don't we, why don't we add something else? So I think this is a real stretch, Bob. Uh, there's no question about that. But it's a stretch in the right direction. Yeah, let me, yeah. let me just say, um, Bob, I'm, we're aware of the difficulty that you had in 1988 raising private funds. And um, we don't minimize the challenge. We hope that we'll be prepared for it. Uh, I don't think we have a chronology yet, a timetable, for when we think 
will be ready to do the feasibility study? How much more cultivation, education do we need to do in the community before asking people whether they're interested in financing this privately? Um, we've even talked about maybe this it would be nice to have uh, 2023 celebrated the 100th anniversary of the original building with at least breaking ground on this. So we know we've got our work cut out for us. It may be that the community in 1988, particularly the children's use of the library, has changed dramatically in 30 years so that there might be a better response uh, to fundraising uh, okay. privately. Hold on, Matt, please. I've been on uh, there's been a question submitted, and I would like to read it now. Uh, and I guess I'll direct this at the building committee and whoever would like to answer from that. Did you consider adding on to the Sarah Partridge Library for some of the children's functions? <coughs> Don't people come from East Middlebury, Salisbury, and Ripton to use the library? Perhaps the Sarah Partridge Library could be more convenient for them. My, my remarks were just... I mean, okay. let, uh, before you get, please, look, did, did any comment to yeah. Or, no. yeah. I was just going to say that when you do raise money for the uh, library, the fact that the public has said that children's libraries need to be considered is, I think, a huge draw for private money. It would be a good piece to go for. I mean, I, that had to do with what they were talking about. This is a whole new subject. Mm -hmm. well. okay. mm -hmm. We, we did not uh, consider the uh, use of Sarah Partridge as a site for some children, though we're certainly aware that children come from that side of town. Um, we did talk about um, having uh, some space someplace else in town, and uh, there are staff issues there, and if Trish is interested in responding to the idea of having uh, a second area for the children, but she's the children's librarian. I, I wouldn't know. I mean, it, let's get you out of it. Uh, having a second children's section so separate from the main building would cause, I believe, more problems than it would solve. Um, at one point, we had looked at having children's spaces in the new town offices, and that would have been next door, literally stepped away with, with many more town staff in the building. If you're talking about a children's, uh, new children's section, children, <coughs> children's services being put in a completely different spot, then you have to completely staff it, um, open to close, full staff, full everything, as well as do we have our own cataloging stuff, do we have our own processing stuff, if we don't, how do we get the books from one place to the other place? There's a lot of, of background that goes into it. It's more than just a space for services. Um, so keeping it close and connected, I think, is the way to go. Um, add my parental input on that, which is also that the Sarah Partridge Library is currently open, what, half day on Tuesday, half day on Thursday, half day on Saturday. And it's got one staff person. So you'd have to drastically, if you're trying to get all of everybody on that side of town to just use that library, you basically have to make that a fully operational library, is what Trisha is saying. And I still don't think it would decrease the need for expanded services here. Even if you took all those children and put them over at Sarah Partridge, you would still probably need to do an expansion here as well. Yeah. Along with that, though, I mean, families okay, come hold, here, hold on. and everybody raise, Please like, raise your hand, and I'll write I did, message. but it's, a, it's off I, the Yeah, you can answer that, but let's get you a microphone. All I was saying is that family, whole families come here. <laughs> Kids are down here. Parents <laughs> go upstairs teens over there, so to separate the kids in a totally different building, I think, would be a huge mistake. Yeah. It would it would negate some of the, the people coming here. Yeah. Plus, a lot of children come from the schools. Yes. Please, please raise your hand to be recognized to speak, and then I will recognize you. Were there any more comments related to, the, to that particular item? Matt? If you didn't hear me. <laughs> no, please use the microphone. Thank you. 
Plus, children come here from school. All the schools are here in Middlebury. My grandson walks here from school to be in the library after school. So I think it'd be really fun to have it that far separated from all the schools. Okay, we have a question in back. Bud? Mark Flora, I'd like to commend the building committee and the architects. It's really a wonderful plan. I'm all for it. And I'm just curious, um, largely because I don't know the status myself, but there's been a lot of plans and discussions about having some sort of a structure back out here. You know, the town had a, an RFP out. There were some construction companies that responded to that. And I was wondering if any of the plans back there uh, could mesh with what happens here at the library in some fashion. I, don't, I just don't know if any of that's been talked about or taken into account. <laughs> so thanks, bud. Sorry to ask hard questions, John. <laughs> um, as, a, as, a, as the chair of the library building committee, I had conversations with uh, select board members, uh, with Jennifer Murray, the town planner, uh, with yeah, Kathleen, with Kathleen maybe, um, trying to find out whether they thought there was such an opportunity for benefiting from a, a building that be, might be built back there. Um, I don't know that there was ever any defined what that would be. Um, you know, the, the, again, you just got to decide if you if you if you're going to have a separate building over there because I can't imagine it would be contiguous with this. Um, is it going to be, sta are there going to be any staff there? You know, we talked about, well, they might want a computer center there, and we like to have a computer center here, but we, you know, we would need staff there. And I don't know whether that's feasible, and I certainly have not heard anything about that project in a year and a half, I think. So I don't know what's happening. So I have a few questions. Every P would be very proud of you to use glass. I mean, it's the, the way to go. I have a question about that old building that is sitting here. From my aesthetic point of view, who owns that building and could we buy it? It is, looks so, it, it's not fitting, but that is, I'm sure you have thought about that. I want to also make a comment on solar. It's the way to go. Um, what we saw in, in Madrid or in other places, they have green walls. Could we make, because it's a big, big looming wall from the parking. Mm -hmm. I saw myself driving up there and I go like, wow, you drive in the wall really. Could it be a living wall? I don't know if you have seen those. There are plans on there and I don't know how the how the, it holds up the stone, but it's beautiful and it's out. And then, the whole roof could be solar, the whole side could be solar. I have a question about why, um, is it a flat roof? Because it's one of my pet peeves, it are flat roofs. <laughs> because they always leak. I mean, and any roof that is flat will leak. I, I've, I've just observed. Um, and then as a taxpayer, I have to say, you got to do a better sales job. Um, I, I, I came here because I go like $9 million, this is incredible, this is a lot of money and you will not be happy. I mean the, the, the town, you will have get pushback. And so there needs to be a model, there needs to be drawing, there needs to be, be tours and, and, and so please do if you can. The flat roof, I would like to say. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the old building up front. So, did you want an answer to any of those questions right yeah, now? Yeah, the two. The old building up front, yeah, that one on the, it's on the left. Next door, yeah. Alex. The, yeah. Yeah. the next one. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about that. Right. Yeah. yeah, that thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And the flat roof. I don't know that they are. The, the, the plans have developed far enough to answer your flat roof question, but I'll let Tom speak to that. It definitely has a flat roof. We find in urban situations where you've got a lot of people, you do not want pitched roofs that are sliding snow off. 
We have done dozens of flat roofs, and we've never had an issue. And I, I think flat roofs had a very bad reputation 30 or 40 years ago, but this is flat. This is basically, I mean, what, what this is showing is it's an inverted, almost like a butterfly, and it drains here, drains there, but it is a flat roof. This is a huge, it's a very large building, and it would be really difficult to put a pitch on a building of that size. And that's reason, if you look at most buildings in any downtown, they are flat, and it's, it's uh, because of the size, and also so that you're not dumping water, snow, and ice on people. And I'm completely comfortable that we can do a flat roof that you, it's not problematic. Our flat roof will last, you know, they're usually warranted for 25 years. We've been getting 30 years out of them. I mean, they do take maintenance. Any roof takes maintenance. But if they are well detailed and the building is really well insulated, so you don't have to freeze thaw, they hold up wonderfully. So they really aren't flat. Yeah. So yeah. They're low slope. We have a question about uh, the property next door. Is that, can anybody from the building committee answer that? Privately owned. Yeah, that's, we certainly looked at that. We looked at what it was on the tax rolls. I don't remember the number. The building's in good shape and is uh, architecturally appropriate to the downtown. Um, I think it would be wonderful if they, somebody would make it available to us. Um, but uh, we did not look into it seriously because it seemed like a cost that we couldn't bear. While, while I have this microphone, there are two things I didn't mention and I want you to know. One is that since the 1988 edition was built, 30 years ago, circulation has doubled of books in the library. And also, the last time that there was a study of the needs for space in this library was 10 years ago. And that study concluded that we needed 5,500 more square feet. And we're talking now about 6,500 6, square feet. So the numbers, not just out of the blue, or uh, it's been around for at least 10 years. Questions, Victoria? Um, I, I appreciate the approach to solving interior layouts and the needs and some of the openness, but I wonder if it's too open um, that you're putting space into open floors when it could be used for other purposes. <laughs> um, the glass is nice in one way, but you've got um, heat loss in the winter and heat gain in the summer. Um, you've got light pollution problems. You've got uh, wasted wall space that you could be used for other purposes inside. So, yeah, <laughs> stacks, bookshelves, whatever it is. Um, so I'm wondering if you could make a smaller building for less money that would be a little more useful than being grand. Um, the wall facing the parking lot, I think, is pretty uh, overwhelming. It looks like a factory warehouse. And I, that, there's no relief to it. It's this flat wall, and there's no um, break in it. And so I hope you can relook at how that is, affects the overwhelming presence to the people. It, it takes away from your entrance. So. And I think those are good points. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the and idea of a green wall is, I think, mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Well, well, or something, or something that breaks up the surface. Um, the size of this, I worry that it will overwhelm the old building instead of complement it. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I just want to—I just want to reiterate. This is a shows you the massing. I mean, there is so much level of detail that would be added to this. You know, we're going to have roofs and, I mean, it just, it's... Yeah. The massing I find pretty overwhelming, but <laughs> massive, exactly. Um, as far as funding, it was my understanding of when the whole idea of finally doing something to meet needs, it was all going to be self-funded. Now it's maybe half if we're lucky. <laughs> um, you know, we just built a new town hall and gymnasium for four million, and this is nine million. 
Uh, the town is, feels pretty overtaxed, it always has and probably always will, but um, it's, um, I would look at meeting needs on a more modest budget. Um, this is in response to John, oh, please wait for the microphone. This is in response to uh, what John just said. Uh, what is the average annual increase in volumes of materials? And uh, what is the projected uh, possibility of space? Is, is, it, is this space projected for 20 years growth or 30 years growth? Or none? Yes. Yes, it is. What's your question? What's your question? Well, if you add 20,000 volumes a year, and in 20 years that's 400,000 volumes, do you have enough space for that in the projection of the new building? Um, I could say a little something about the, the projections for growth. I think we have about 44,000 volumes in the adult collection now, and another 29,000 in the children's, and we projected there wouldn't be much change at all in the size of the adult collection in terms of uh, uh, physical books. And in terms of the children's collection, we did uh, anticipate growth. Uh, we didn't set up a firm um, projection endpoint on that. I think we set about 5,000. Uh, I think that was what we had set. I'd like to go back to Victoria's question or comment. I think the, the glass and the staircase and all of that are much too grand. I think I have a problem with the town hall. I'm, I'm not a taxpayer, so sorry. I use the library, but I'm not a taxpayer. But I have a problem with that much, quote, empty space in that in the town hall. And I think the stairs, if, I would like, really like it if you could work out a way to use the staircase you're going to put back in as the main staircase. You may not be able to. I mean, I see that there's, there's a wall. But what you've got there, to me, is just empty, pretty space, not useful space. But I think there's... A if I could just respond. I mean, we don't know exactly the perfect opening in the floor, but I do think if you want a lobby, I do think it's important that you have a lobby so when you come in, you know that there's more in the library. It doesn't have a, uh, an eight-foot ceiling. You've got to kind of find your way upstairs. So I think it's very important. Whether we've got the right proportions for the opening, we just don't know yet until we do more study. But I understand your, your question. May I comment on that, too? I mean, it's always possible to build uh, a storehouse library. Uh, but the library is supposed to be more than a storehouse. It's to be a place to invite people to explore new places and new spaces. And I understand I'm a taxpayer too, so I know that the problem is it's taxpayer uh, heavily funded. But really inexpensive space. Let me point out that the original library was not built with the cheapest sort of materials. It's got face stone. It's a very elaborate classical building. Uh, they wanted to say something on Main Street which said something special about the town of Middlebury and about the library. So yes, you could do some of those things, and maybe there are things that Tom and his associates can figure out to how to do that. But at some point, you're going to move to the other direction. You're building a storage facility. You're not building a circulating library, where you circulate inside and you can say, hey, there's something going on up there. I want to find out what that is. So I don't know the right proportion of that, and I wish that we're, the buildings were less expensive. But <clears throat> it does seem to me that much of what's been done is to make this a building worthy of what the aspirations of this town would be in terms of how a building should look. As far as the glass is concerned, but I, I like the glass because it it actually not only does not clash with the current, the original library, but it reflects the original library. So you're actually seeing it twice. 
Uh, and that's a, a thing which contemporary architects do very well when they do it well, and I think they did. We uh, get somebody new, but then we can get to you. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Um, as a town historian, I feel like I uh, should talk, ask about the rare book collection and special collections. Um, have, uh, has there been any thought about how they can be stored in a climate controlled setting with where they could be used? Because right now they're kind of like locked away <laughs> and they're kind of neat. Uh, we have not discussed it, that we haven't gotten to that point in the planning, so I, I don't think we can really address that. Uh, uh, the books are accessible. They are, um, they are accessible today. You, you can obviously you can get the key and, and, and use them. Our collection really has emphasized. Um, we do have the Vermont collection, but. Our emphasis has been for many years on circulating materials as much as possible uh, rather than collecting materials of uh, purely um, archival value. I was just going to suggest that maybe we could think differently about instead of thinking smaller, thinking, you know, less grand. What if we went to some private foundations around the country and said we want to build the library of the future and put every possible bell and whistle into the thing and then get the funding that way? I'd be willing to help with that. <laughs> the problem with foundations is they're very uninterested by and large in bricks and mortar these days, so that's a caution. <laughs> okay, I have a question that has come in written, and then I think Laura has another question. Um, I think this is a comment, not a question. Uh, the original building of the Illsley was paid for by Colonel Illsley, mm -hmm. not by the town or private donations. Point. Um, <laughs> Laura, where is he when we need him? So I'm, I'm just curious. We're we're building a building that could be solar ready, but the price tag doesn't include solar. That doesn't make sense to me. You know, going into the future, you know, we're about to have a climate economy conversation on Monday. You know, we're talking about meeting goals for renewable energy by 2050 and and I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned that the heating system isn't included um, as part of the price. Oh, no, no, it's included. Oh, it is. Okay. It, we did, it's not defined. I mean, the it's price not, here is all inclusive. We don't have a solar system. We don't have need. But you've got a building you're ready to move into. We just don't know what, what the most. I think that the price does need to reflect the solar array. We're, we're, we're with you. We want a net zero building. I think the building committee wants a net zero building. I know. I heard you say that you're going to exceed building code. That's great. You know, and that it will be a thermally uh, superior building. That's good. One thing about the large cost. I mean, we've spent a lot of money on a fire station and a police station and a town office building and a rec center. Other than the rec center, the library is really the building where people, real people, go and do things. Real people. Uh, I mean, many, many, many people. <laughs> Hardly anybody gets to even see the inside of the fire station. <clears throat> Once in a while we get to have a meeting at the police station in their meeting room, um, the town office, and go in there and pay your taxes and vote. But I mean, the library is a place where a lot of people go. And it seems to me the price is not out of line, given that fact. Is there anybody who has a question who hasn't been able to pose that question or comment? I have a comment. I wanted to go back to the very beginning, an early question about the 
declining school population and how that fit. I'm pr principal at Weybridge Elementary School. We've definitely seen a decline in population and the growth in population. So um, one of the pieces that I think is really significant about it as we talk about investments is that I actually think that the um, projection is quite drastic but not necessarily realistic. And one way to make it not so realistic that we lose children and families interested in being in, in Middlebury mm -hmm. is having a really extraordinary library. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's really important to think about that in terms of investment in that way. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is that the school system has very recently adopted the International Baccalaureate Program. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the few programs that you see that says, <coughs> What's the library set up in your community and your school? It's assuming that students will really need access to excellent material and guidance in that um, and be able to use um, the future of technology well and they have access to that and also have a place for creating um, uh, information as well as finding information. So I think that that's been really an intense consideration in the development of this and something that we should keep in mind as we think about um, penny pinching or not. Um, I think it's really a, an important part of the life of the community. We have a question now back from Heather. Um, just on the comment about students and uh, enrollment along those lines. Um, one thing that I would really like to see the committee consider and the community explore is more um, financial support from the rest of the school district towns mm -hmm. because all of those students are served by this library entirely on the tax backs of the Middlebury taxpayers. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that model looks like. I don't know how it works. I don't have any suggestions off the top of my head. But in a common sense way, if all of those IB students are all in our district and they're all supported by this library and this hub community, they should, those towns should contribute, I think, to the building of it, the expense of it the maintenance, it really should become a true community library and not just a Middlebury library. And that goes also to private fundraising that we should consider not just Middlebury residents in that private fundraising. And maybe these are things that the building committee has already considered, but if not, I would ask that you do consider it going forward. I'll quickly speak to that. The Board of Trustees are, are considering both, and the, uh, the contribution of other towns whose children and adults use our library is very is high on our priority list. And of course, we would just done Middlebury people. So uh, there's been a, a question or a comment submitted, and I think it's in this vein, so I'll read that now. Um, the, the comment is, I think other towns use the library with people from other towns help out financially. So mm -hmm. that seems to be another common thought. Mm -hmm. one, one thing to add to, one point to add uh, regarding contributions from other towns. Um, towns like Shoreham has a, a well-supported, uh, a library, a flat library that's well-supported by their community. But I, there is an opportunity, I think, with towns like Weybridge and Port and all that um, where we have uh, many non-residents who come and use Ilsley Library here, uh, and um, but because they don't in their in their own communities have a uh, uh, a vibrant don't have a library. Cornwall has a very small one. Uh, Weybridge doesn't have one at all. Um, so there are I think there are opportunities uh, to explore. That. Are there other questions or comments? We're coming up on 9 o'clock, so it's, it's all working out very nicely. With that. <laughs> but if there are any last comments or questions, please, Laura, and then Chris. Okay. okay. So I love 
um, that we're trying to create a very accessible building and access to our buildings in Middlebury is very important, as we know. Um, so I, I really love the plan for access, and I love what we're communicating about. Um, the future for electric vehicles and parking and access for them. And, and I do anticipate that we will have more bikes and all kinds of bikes, not the ones that we currently are thinking of, but you know, a whole range of different kinds. So I, I think it would be good to anticipate where that sheltered bike parking might go, because I think that would also be a strong statement for the downtown. I think that's a good comment. Okay, we have a comment from Chris. I'll just comment about the, <laughs> comment about the glass walls. Uh, I spent eight years in Bicentennial Hall. If you, and you've been in that building, there's a solid glass wall facing west. And I, for one, when it was initiated that way, saw we've lost all this research and teaching space. How can we do that? And yet I spent eight years enjoying that space with students because it opens up the whole building. Mm -hmm. And the students respond appropriately. Yeah. And I think there are unintended consequences for an open space that's very important. Natalie, are you going to finish the thought? I am. <laughs> the last word. Always has the last word. Yeah, I want to second what you said. It's very, very true. Buildings with glass walls are open from the outside and from the inside, and they're very, very pleasant to be in. This building otherwise has some pretty closed up places, but when you walk in that building, there is uh, no visible activity. You go someplace else, upstairs, over to the left, so to have it open and to be able to see upstairs, I think, is a plus. And to be able to see in from the outside is a plus. But the other piece that's so important design-wise with architectural understanding is that it leaves the solid building as the focal point. And the glass allows it to receive. It's a huge building, but it receives. And it isn't imposing on the front street as a result of the glass. I think when you add to um, a historically important building, it's really important to make the addition be a secondary voice. What's inside is what's important. And how it feels when you're in there and are doing things or whatever. You've made it flexible, so over the years they can do it in lots of different ways. But it, and also it's important, I think, for adults to have computer access. In the future, I think that's um, a lot of people in this town do not have computers at home. They go to the library when they have to do something. So having that available is incredibly important, and having room to be able to do it. That's the last word. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I would just encourage you, if you have other thoughts, when you go home tonight and uh, start mulling around the conversation here today, that you would submit them to the trustees. You can, uh, I, I think you can point them here to the library and, and Chris's Chris attention, sure and you can get them to the trustees. Right. Um, but it's very important. Thank you for all your comments and questions tonight. And please go back out into the community and urge others to weigh in on the proposal. Thank you. Exactly. Thanks a lot.